Test. Yes. If you're recording. Good. Am I in the shot? You are in the shot of the responses. Wonderful. Like we're missing. What are we missing? Aha. <laughs> I knew we were missing people. Okay, I'll get started. I'm sure someone else is going to come in and then you can all point at them when they walk in. Right. Uh, welcome back. Uh, this is Discord Thinking, and I'm Richard, and we're in the last week. This has been a long struggle uphill. We've gone through a bunch of material. Uh, in the uh, most recent weeks, we did multi-level models. Multi-level models were the goal for most of you, as for me. And what I'd like to do now in the last week is show you how some of the conceptual tools and modeling tools that you use to build multi-level models uh, open up a world for you of other exotic sorts of models that you might use that are in essence also multi-level, but their purpose is different than merely achieving partial pooling among different exchangeable clusters. Uh, they do, however, accomplish that as well, because pooling is just a thing that happens when you set up the model right. It's not something you have to specifically tell the model to do. It's just if you set up assumptions that make sense and establish relationships among variables, you will get pooling. And you will get it because it is rational. <laughs> right? That's just to say. Now, if the model's bad, then the rationality will lead you into a false world. Uh, as I keep saying, there are small worlds and large worlds. Uh, but pooling is... Pooling is a generalized phenomenon. Uh, it's not exotic at all. It just arises from the way learning works. Uh, it just happens. Um, and it's just uh, its a weird historical artifact, I think, of the way statistics is taught, is that it's presented like it's strange, uh, but it's regression to the mean. That's what it is, right? That's, it's just like you get an ordinary regression. Okay, so with that, uh, we're going to talk about uh, missing data and other opportunities. These are things you can do with the concepts you learn for multi-level models and uh, push through Markov chains um, and be more inferentially honest uh, in your scientific work. So before we get to the uh, boring computational part and the examples, let me take you through a couple of general points to set up this material. <clears throat> so uh, forget statistics for a second and think about pancakes. These are pancakes. Yeah? Plausible? Yeah, so my art is not always persuasive. Um, these are pancakes. And uh, pancakes have two sides, I assert. We'll ignore the edge. <laughs> and uh, two sides. And um, I want you to imagine that there are three pancakes that have been prepared. Like maybe I tried to make some pancakes for you, and initially the skillet was too hot. Uh, so the first pancake I cook, it's burnt on both sides. That's what the black hatching is supposed to represent. So there's the burnt pancake. Second pancake, the skillet is now cooling down. The first side ends up burnt, and the second side is just right. So now we've got pancake number one, which is burnt, burnt, and pancake two, which is burnt, correct. Burnt, not burnt. Uh, unburnt? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what the word is. And then pancake three is exactly right. It's not burnt on either side. These are the three pancakes. Uh, now, I serve you a pancake. Um, and uh, you don't get to see which one it was because you weren't in the kitchen. I just put, bring a plate out to you and put it down. And what you see is that the upside of this pancake is burnt. And now I ask you the question, because you've been in my statistics course for 10 weeks now. Uh, tell me, what's the probability that the other side of this pancake is burnt? Now, you don't want to eat this pancake. I understand that. <laughs> But you do want to answer this question, right? Why? Because it represents the structure of lots of inferential problems. It's a way to help yourself understand things. Uh, this is uh, a, a version of a fairly famous uh, logic and probability puzzle. And I give you the, the his, a citation to the history in the textbook in the chapter. Um, it's not easy, actually. I, I, this, that's why it's, it's famous. This is actually, it's a simple problem. This is what Probabilists love problems like this, right? It's got a simple setup. You can hold all the information in your head, and yet uh, your intuitions, well, I shouldn't say you, most people's intuitions, are wrong. So what's your intuition? Now, I've just told you it's wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, most people's intuition, uh, uh, according to all the data, uh, is just like mine, the first time I saw this problem, is that it's one half. Why? Because there are two pancakes that have burnt sides, one of them is burnt on both sides, and the other is only burnt on one side. So the probability that the other side is burnt is a half. 
that is wrong, as I've told you, right? It's wrong, but that's the intuition we get. Uh, what's the right answer? Well, we'll work to that. <laughs> uh, but the question is, how would you figure this out and figure out it's wrong? And the lesson I want you to take away from this is not that uh, we're bad at this, because <laughs> uh, you knew that. We're all bad at this. We're humans, right? It's this thing I keep saying, computers are good at things we're not good at. They're bad at things we're good at. Yeah, they're good at chess, bad at walking, right? <laughs> Hard to teach a robot to walk. This is like cutting edge science, make a robot walk. Um, they can play chess, that's no problem. Uh, I think chess and Go are exclusively uh, held among tournaments among computers now. People are just out, right? It's just uninteresting to have people play those games now. <laughs> but uh, uh, So how should you figure these things out? Well, stop trying to be clever is what I want to encourage everybody. Don't use your intuition. Just stop. Don't even try to be clever. Just use the logic and figure it out. That's what's great about Bayesian inference. It's just logic. It's just extended logic. That means it's garbage in, garbage out. That's what logic is. Uh, but it means you don't have to be clever. And the way these probability puzzles are often presented in books, uh, it's taught like uh, it's solved through some clever realization, some kind of mathematical insight. And so I think this teaches the wrong lesson. It, it teaches you that you need to be fantastically clever, like the author of your textbook, <laughs> to figure these things out. The author of your textbook was not fantastically clever. They are just presenting themselves as if they are. <laughs> right? How do we actually figure these things out? We use cold brute force logic. That's what we do. We use probability theory. Uh, that's the idea. Just avoid being clever. <laughs> if you avoid being clever, you will appear very clever uh, to people who are trying to be clever. Right? So intuition is a terrible guide to probability. It's, it's uh, not intuitive at all. Uh, but you don't need to be clever to solve these problems. You just need to be, as I say here, ruthless. Uh, just apply conditional probability. Uh, conditional probability has very few rules. Uh, they're the laws of probability. Uh, you already know them. Uh, I'll remind you of them in a moment. <laughs> um, and when you're fitting statistical models in this class, this is all you're using as well. When you, you set up the model definition, you're defining all the assumptions. And then the laws of conditional probability let you find the implications of those assumptions. The implications are already there. You've stated them. It's just to intuit them is very hard, but it's very easy for logic to draw them out and represent them. And that's all the work we've done in this course is really just that. Just that. Yeah, nothing at all, right? Uh, but the, the, you don't have to be clever and realize, for example, that you need pooling. You get pooling for free. It arises, emerges from your assumptions. It isn't something that you say, ah, I want some pooling here. No, <laughs> if you specify a population of cafes, then you get pooling. And then you have to understand, this is the hard thing for us mortals, you have to understand why it happens, right? Why is that a necessary consequence of the assumptions? And that's incredibly useful. Um, so uh, as the people in my department know, um, uh, I didn't start off doing statistics in science. I started off doing uh, evolutionary theory. And it's the same business there. Uh, we make assumptions about you know, evolutionary contexts and environmental contexts. And then we'd like to deduce the implications of those assumptions. And we learn a tremendous amount through those exercises, even though the consequences are, of course, well, they're consequences of the assumptions. They're already there when you state the assumptions, but you can't realize them. And that's why we need the logic, is to reveal the consequences of assumptions that are not at all intuitive. It's the same business in statistics. Okay, that's sermon number uh, 73, I think, in the course, right? Um, so, Let's figure this out. What does conditional probability mean? Conditional probability is the probability of something you want to know, conditional on what you already know. This is our goal. This is a posterior probability, right? This is all these things we've done before. We'd like to know the, the plausibility, the probability, the plausibility of this thing, the state of the world that we want to know about, conditional on something we do know about. Now, sometimes the, the, the things you know about give you no information, but you figure that out through the same procedure. So it's all, it's all the same business. Uh, so let's do this with pancakes, okay? You all like pancakes? Yes, no, yeah, no, thank you. That was, Natalia, that was a very good job. I appreciate that. <laughs> and everyone else is kind of like halfway nodding. Pancakes are excellent, people. You should be enthusiastic about this. So uh, uh, here's our, here's our uh, pancake. It's a mystery pancake. You cannot peek, okay? Look under the pancake. You just have to use logic to figure this out. We want to know the probability the downside is burned. Um, what we do know is that the, bur that the upside is burned. So what's the probability the downside is burned conditional on the, on the upside being burned? That's the question. 
And we know from uh, the rules of probability that uh, that is defined in terms of two other things that we might be able to calculate. Uh, the joint probability uh, that the upside is burnt and the downside is burnt. Yeah? Probably a pancake is burnt on both sides. That's what, how you can read that. You with me? Yeah? And the, divided by the probability the upside is burnt. That's just the definition of a conditional probability. That's all it is. Yeah? If you ever forget, uh, sorry, now I'm not tall enough to reach my own slide here, but um, if you move the denominator on the right-hand side over here by multiplying both sides by it, uh, the joint probability is just equal to the conditional times the probability of the, of the thing you're conditioning on, right? That's, that's an easy way you can remember it. And then you can just divide and move it under. Yeah? Did that help? Sure. Yeah, you're like, yeah, whatever you say. <laughs> you're going to get good at this because uh, Anna is going to drill some of you folks uh, soon over this. Anna will make you dream in probability theory. It will uh, it'll be great. Um, so... Oh, there's really like three rules. That's it. There's almost, that's all of it. Uh, so let's start filling stuff in we know. So the probability, we need the denominator here. The probability, the burnt, uh, the upside is burnt, <coughs> is the probability we've got the BB pancake. BB means burnt on both sides. Burnt, burnt. Right? The probability of burnt, burnt is uh, uh, when we have the uh, burnt, burnt pancake, the probability the upside is burnt is one. Right? There are three states in the world the world can be in to say the probability that the burnt side is up. There are three pancakes. And so if it's the first pancake, burnt, burnt, then the probability the burnt side, the upside is burnt is one. If it's instead the burnt, unburnt pancake, then it's a half chance. Right? Because imagine I'm the cook in the kitchen and I'm taking the pancake and I'm just flipping it randomly onto the plate. Either side is equally likely to be up. That's the assumption here. If it's the burnt, burnt pancake, it'll always be burnt up. If it's the burnt, unburnt pancake, it's a half chance. Yeah? And then there's the last pancake, the good one, the one that you wish I had served you but did not. Uh, it is unburnt on both sides, and so there's no chance we would observe a burnt side up. You with me? Okay. Uh, and you can calculate these things then. Uh, let's assume that the prior on the pancakes is that I selected one at random. That's an assumption we need to introduce here, but remember, you always need a prior. Priors let you average. Uh, they're required. And... Um, so that gives us a, a probability of one-third for each pancake. So this becomes one-third times one plus one-third times a half, which is a half. Right? It's also one-third times zero. I dropped that term. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's move on. I know you're loving this, right? <laughs> some, some math in the morning. Uh, uh, and, but I'm showing you how this is how I solve these problems. I'm not clever at all. I'm just ruthless. I just I just plug stuff in and go through the rules. That's, that's the whole business. Uh, so... Now we can get the conditional probability because we know both things. What's the probability of a burnt, burnt pancake? I just told you, it's one-third. Yeah? Because that's the probability that the cook selected it. Yeah? So the conditional probability that the, burnt, that, that the downside is burnt, conditional on the upside being burnt, is one-third divided by a half, which is two-thirds. It's not a half. Uh, that's the answer. Now we've got the answer. It doesn't match. It didn't didn't match your intuitions, and now the question is why? What was wrong with your intuition? And here's the moment where you can learn something. Or at least when I first encountered this, I felt like I learned something. And the thing you learn is, the mistake is to focus on pancakes. What you want to focus on is sides. <laughs> sides of pancakes. Right? So if you focus on the pancake, you get it wrong because you think, oh, there are two pancakes with, with at least one side burn. And then you count the wrong stuff. But we're, we're asking a question about a side, not about a pancake. So we've got to count the sides, right? What are the relevant numbers of sides that could be on the other side? Well, there are three sides that are relevant, and two of them are burnt, right? <laughs> and so it's this counting uh, procedure. So it's uh, 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 the whole business in probability theory is a matter of figuring out what it is you're trying to count over, and then you count up all the ways it could happen, right? What are all the sides that... that uh, could have arisen uh, from this, and then how many of those sides are burnt? Uh, and uh, the answer is two out of three. So you should take a look through, this is the opening to chapter 14, and, and uh, you should take a look through it and work through this yourself on paper. And it's not a hard problem, but this is basically what your computer is doing automatically for you when you specify Bayesian models and it does the calculations. It's, this is what the Markov chains are for, is, is to obviate the need to be a clever person. 
because you don't want to do that. Your computer is clever. You tell it what to do. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the whole gambit in this business. We express the information as constraints and distributions. This is how we define statistical models and logic puzzles. Um, and then you just let logic discover the implications. When you discover those implications, you may decide quite reasonably that the model is silly. Uh, that's perfectly fair. Logic is garbage in, garbage out. It doesn't tell you how things, what you must believe. Uh, it tells you the implications of assumptions. Yeah, see the distinction. Um, but the good news is you don't have to be a clever person. And in fact, trying to be clever results in, famously, in lots and lots of errors. Uh, some of you will know this uh, famous story about uh, a newspaper columnist named Marilyn uh, Vosavant and the Monty Hall problem. No? Yeah, some of you do. Okay, well, I won't. Uh, if, depending on how fast I go today, maybe I'll end with that story, but I have a goal of how much material I want to get through. The, the short version is, there was a, a newspaper columnist uh, who got a, a mathematical a probability puzzle problem correct, and then a bunch of mathematicians wrote in to tell her she was wrong. Uh, it's a fun story about avoiding being clever. <laughs> um, and then the revelation in the, the logic puzzle is called the Monty Hall problem, uh, based on a game show. She was on in the 60s, 50s, 60s? A long time ago. There were donkeys uh, on the show. Um, anyway, if I, depending on how fast I go today, I can tell you the whole story. But Okay. Uh, so let me give you some examples of this getting ruthless business. We've been doing this the whole course, but two cases where, in my experience, it's difficult to intuit the approach for how you deal with measurement error, and uh, a very grotesque form of measurement error is uh, the data are missing entirely. <laughs> that's, that's error. Uh, it's hard to intuit what you should do in those cases, but you don't have to. You don't have to be clever. Just state the information. State what the error is state what the missingness is. And then the model automatically tells you an approach that is a consequence of the assumptions. And that's what we're going to do today. Uh, the other uh, thing uh, uh, that will be useful as conceptual introduction to this material is to think that also is true with measurement error and missing, uh, missing data. We confront this thing that I like to jokingly, cheekily call decolonizing Bayes. Decolonizing Bayesian inference. So here's the basic story. Uh, Bayesians didn't call Bayesian inference Bayesian. This is a term due to Ronald Fisher, who was an opponent of Bayesian inference. Uh, and usually when we teach Bayes, we use non-Bayesian terminology to teach it. Why? Because when in the early uh, 20th century especially, uh, Bayesians were in the minority, and, and uh, people like Fisher, especially in the mid-20th century, worked really hard to exterminate Bayes. Uh, they were an embattled minority uh, fighting against a powerful Anglophone dictator dictator <laughs> pictured here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so this is a bit tongue-in-cheek, right? I don't mean this to be taken literally, but the consequence is that there are lots of awkward things about how Bayes is taught and how it's learned that are, that are purely historical accident. And if we could rewind time to the current situation where, if anything, in stats departments, uh, uh, Bayes is the powerful situation. That's not true in the sciences yet, but in, in Research statistics department, Bayes is taken much more seriously than non Bayesian approaches in general. And, but that's a flip side. That happened during the 20th century, that there was an inversion of the power. Um, Dennis Lindley uh, was a, a very well-known Bayesian statistician uh, from the 20th century, and uh, uh, he became chair of statistics at uh, Oxford or Cambridge. Sorry, I forget the exact detail. And when it happened, people were like, oh my god, uh, this is like the Ottomans being taken over the Vatican or something. <laughs> I mean, people were really just like in shock. How could this possibly happen that Dennis Lindley is now chair of statistics? And uh, it, it was a, it's a big turning point, right, in the history of these things. Um, and now, of course, it's not every I mean, Bayesian approaches are taken extremely seriously, to say the least. And the, this whole decolonizing rhetoric doesn't seem to make much sense. But it's part of the history of what happened, that we still teach it using awkward terms. So this is useful to point out, I think, because it, it helps you guys steer around conceptual obstacles, is that some of the thought patterns that you've developed in your earlier statistics courses, learning non-Bayesian statistics, just don't actually apply to the Bayesian framework. But I've been cheating you by using those terms anyway, right? It's like, uh, so I'll give you examples. Uh, so data, uh, in the Bayesian framework, data are just uh, an observed variable. Uh, there's nothing fundamentally different when you set up the model 
about something you can observe and something you can't. You, you assign them probability distributions. They look the same, right, in your model. There's no distinction. If y, you give it a distribution, is y a parameter or data? You can't tell just from the model definition. How do you know? Well, if you feed the, those values in, then it's data. If you don't, then you get samples for them instead. Uh, and that is something that will be very important to us today. So parameter, uh, the other side of this coin, is just an unobserved variable. And whether a symbol is data or parameter can change across analyses for exactly the same model. And that's what we're going to exploit today. And how can it change? Because if you observe it or not, that if you don't observe it, you have to infer it. And the implications of the model, the assumptions you've given, it allow you to infer it. Uh, you can't infer it exactly in most cases, but you can narrow down your uncertainty about it. And likewise, if it's uh, sometimes you do get to observe things, and then you don't have to infer them because you observe them. But there's the the, the distinction doesn't isn't perfect until you've made the observation. Once the observation exists, the distinction is incredibly important because it changes how you do calculations, so you have how you set up the Markov chain and all kinds of other stuff, and that's extremely important. Um, <clears throat> likewise, likelihood and prior, following on from this, uh, the, a likelihood is a distribution of an observed variable. It's a prior for data. <laughs> yeah. And a prior is just the distributional assignment for an unobserved variable. But they look the same in the model definition because logically they're the same until you know what's observed and isn't. Yeah? Now this will, this will be blasphemy in non basic statistics where the distinction between data and parameter is some fundamental fact of, like it's like a quantum particle. Uh, it's fundamentally different. But in Bayesian, and that's fine. I have nothing against the non Bayesian approach. You can do lots of great work that way. Just this is a Bayesian course. <laughs> and so my job is to help you get the right intuitions about Bayes. And uh, so all of this is, it, these awkwardness arises, I think, from a, a, a deeper difference that is often very hard to teach. I've always struggled with it, is that in Bayes, probability is not ontological, it's epistemological, uh, meaning there's nothing random in the real world in the Bayesian view of inference. It's uh, randomness is always just a proxy for our lack of knowledge about what is determining events. We use probability distributions because we can't measure or we don't know the deterministic processes. And so we summarize our ignorance with a big distribution. But there's nothing ontological. You're not claiming when you assign a probability distribution to a variable that the world is fundamentally random. You're not going to upset Einstein, right? You guys know this Einstein quote about play, God doesn't play dice. These fights with the uh, anyway, we won't review history. I'm always tempted. To those of you who know me, it's like you can get me ranting on history of science really fast. But uh, uh, I, I get the impression that in introductory stats courses, uh, people are often taught that randomness is like a thing in the world, uh, and that there's like a property of some process. Uh, but I, I fundamentally believe, as a scientist, that's wrong. It's, it's absolutely wrong. And so you get misled into thinking that probability distributions are claims about how the process works. But it isn't. It's just a summary of our ignorance. Uh, and that's the way we've used them in this course. And so that turns out to be constructive because it gives you permission to summarize your ignorance and then see the implications of that. Um, and that's what we're going to do here. Uh, yeah, anyway, so this is my little, my, my tongue-in-cheek joke about decolonization. So let's exploit these facts. <coughs> Uh, move on to some examples. So I think I can do all the measurement error uh, in the remaining time today, and then we'll do missing data on Friday, and I'll do a course wrap-up as well with some, you know, hopefully wise things to say about statistics. Okay? Yeah. I know I'm skeptical too. Um, <laughs> but uh, measurement error. Uh, measurement always entails error to some extent, and how that error gets into the model uh, uh, affects how the inferences are drawn from it. Uh, so what I want to do here is um, take what you already know about measurement error, because you've been modeling measurement error for the whole course, actually. Uh, there's always measurement error in these models. It's just that it, it, in the traditional, simple sorts of models we do, you, we don't talk about it that way. You, get, you deal with the problems of measurement automatically. Uh, but sometimes you get error, measurement error in less convenient ways, and then you need to know how to deal with it as well. So, for example, in a typical linear regression, 
the sigma parameter we're estimating, that residual variance, is like a kind of error. Uh, it's a precision issue. Um, we assume it's constant across all the observations. But what if the error isn't constant? What if some observations have a lot more error than others because they were derived from fewer measurements, for example? That is a really common problem. Uh, or, uh, those of you who are psychologists, you have multiple raters and some of them suck. Uh, so you, you've got rater reliability. Um, you want to use ra all the ratings instead of throwing any of them away, but you need to downweight ratings from certain individuals. How could you do that? So this, I think this is the way you could do that. If you're willing to assign reliabilities to individuals, which I think psychologists in my experience are, <laughs> they're very eager with such things, uh, then you can do this. Um, and then, so we're going to do that first. We're going to look at an example where there's variable error across observations, the outcomes in a model. And I want to show you how to set up that model. And, um, and then second, we'll finish, uh, I think I can do this today, on a case where there's error on the predictors as well. Um, and it can also vary across cases. That is, your right-hand side variables are measured with error. So we don't know the data value. Instead, you have a range of data values that could be there. This happens uh, frighteningly often in the statistical problems that concern me the most in my field. Um, some people in the room who fought with this. Uh, when you do anthropological field work, you rarely know a person's age exactly. Uh, it's just a fact. Why? Because in most parts of the world, the human species does not care about birthdays. Birthdays are a very strange thing, especially here in Germany. Sorry, I have to say it <laughs> as an immigrant. <laughs> but um, the, the, this parasitic birthday party uh, rotation thing where, people, where students bankrupt themselves to throw birthday parties, man, you guys figure out a better equilibrium soon. <laughs> this, is, this is a better way to do this. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's, if I can be ethnocentric for a moment. Uh, in general, uh, birthdays are not tracked, and most people don't know their age in most parts of the world for most, most periods of human history. There are proxies. So you can ask people their age, and they'll give you a number. <laughs> Often it's impossible. Uh, there are ways to do this, and, and anthropologists spend, have spent a lot of time trying to develop ways to hone in and narrow down what a person's age might be. But usually there's still residual error. Right? You can bracket by siblings and, and things like that. So there are the biological constraints on how human populations are generated actually helps you a ton with this. You can do a lot. But you can rarely get the error to zero. So we deal with this problem uh, routinely. And when, so yeah, anthropological analyses that put in fixed ages as if they were known, you might be a little concerned that the results are anti-conservative, uh, just a little bit. Same with the primatologists in the room. This, this is a problem that I know that you're worried about, right? Primatologists actually worry about this much more than, than anthropologists in general do, and to their credit. Um, so, error on outcome. Uh, think back to the Waffle House data. You remember these data from chapter five? Yeah, so there's some, yeah, you guys, it's my book, and you know I should know, but it's, uh, I think it's chapter five, yeah? One of those chapters, when we introduce multiple regression. So the basic idea is we're trying to predict the divorce rate in various countries, and we have, a, we have various um, things to do this with. Uh, we're not gonna use the Waffle House uh, thing in this example, but turns out Waffle Houses are correlated with divorce, right? But uh, uh, instead, we'll look at the median age of marriage, which is um, one of the better predictors in this. Uh, sociologically speaking, to remind you, uh, the earlier people get married, the more likely they are to divorce. Uh, fill that in without ever causal hypothesis you like, but that's kind of true. And um, uh, so it, in those original data, I ignored it back in Chapter 5, but it was true uh, that there's a column for the standard error on the divorce rate. The divorce rate is estimated from a finite sample in each state. They don't know the actual uh, divorce rates. This is how general statistics in the states are done. Uh, it would be very expensive to do total surveys. And uh, those of you who spent time in the United States know uh, the United States is barely integrated better than the European Union. <laughs> right? So now I've been insulted to political assemblies at the same time. But what I mean is the individual states in the United States keep their records in completely different ways. So you cross a border, and it could be a whole new world of record keeping or the absence thereof of record keeping. Uh, marriages could be legally a completely different entity. It's, it's really, it's like a bunch of little countries where there are open borders, right? Which is why I do this comparison to uh, certain parts of the European Union. And uh, so if you try to get official statistics like this, sometimes it requires some creativity. And finite samples are often taken within the states. Um, so there, so 
responsible uh, sociologists uh, report standard errors on these measurements. Yeah, the standard error of the estimator. So um, we've included these data in this data set. And the thing that's interesting about this is that uh, there's lots of heterogeneity in the air. For some states, the estimates are much more precise than others. Right? Why? It's typically the larger states, you can estimate the divorce rate better. Because in each year, there's only so many divorces. Right? And we're trying to talk about the average rate over time, over some window of, say, a decade. Right? Obviously, over in the real long term, it changes. It's not a constant, but over some window. If you've only got a year of data, then in a big state, you've got a lot more data with which to estimate the divorce rate than in a small state. In a state like Utah, uh, which is not only small, but divorce has it, the divorce rate is low, it'll be very hard to know what the rate is in the long run. It'll be very stochastic. Does this make sense, it just intuitively? So other people have calculated from those facts, the survey results, the standard error, and I give them to you, right? In a future course, maybe we'll start with the raw survey results and we can build all the way up, uh, which would be, uh, then you have a multi-level model, right? You just start with the individual divorces and the population size and build it all the way up. Maybe another time. Um, so as a consequence here, I'll show you on the right the way the data look. Uh, on the top, divorce rate against median age of marriage, and I've drawn those vertical um, line segments to indicate the standard error, plus or minus one standard error on both sides. And you'll see that some of those bars are much bigger than others. And that's the point. Yeah. And the, and the bottom here, what I'm trying to show you is if you plot those divorce rates with their errors indicated on them uh, against the log population of the state, you see that there's a very strong relationship, right? It's mainly big states. Each year, you get a lot more information about the divorce rate. And every other vital system. Right, the mortality rate, the birth rate. It's just that the sample size is bigger. That's all it is. Yeah, you with me? Is this exciting? Yeah? <laughs> okay. That's somebody, yes, thank you. I'm excited by this. I love this. This is cool stuff. So, uh, this is the, you know, the music of the spheres. <laughs> this is what drives the universe, right? Can't you hear it? The celestial music right now? No. Okay. <laughs> I've been reading about Gauss, so now I'm thinking about celestial music all the time. So, uh, uh, Let's put the error in the outcome first, because I think this is the easier one to think about. So focus on the divorce rate variable. Um, uh, the key insight is to realize that uh, we don't know the actual divorce rate in any state. So that's a parameter now. We have to estimate it. What we do have as data is, is uh, an estimate of it. And that estimate has some error. So the thing to realize is that our, ob our observation of the divorce rate in a particular country is going to have some distribution. Uh, it'll probably be normal, because the central limit theorem, <laughs> or at least if you're not willing to impose other assumptions. The normal, remember, is the maximum entropy distribution assignment. It is the most conservative, spreads probability as evenly as possible of any assumption you could make. Yeah, so that's, that's the reason to use it. It's conservative. Um, then there's some true value we don't know. That's the, the center of this Gaussian distribution. So you imagine you, you've taken a... a You've taken a sample from a particular year from this. Um, the, the central tendency in that is to true value because there's symmetric error on both sides. And uh, so we want to know the mean, the location uh, of this thing, but we haven't observed it. Instead, we've got one sample from this distribution. Yeah? And it turns out that's enough to learn stuff. Uh, it, it, I'll show you. And then uh, we have this other thing that's observed, which is the standard error. So that's observed, and that's observed, and this is not. This is what we want on the left-hand side of our regression. It's now a thing that's a parameter inside the distribution assignment. You with me? Yeah? Let's we'll stick it all together. Here's the full model. Um, so uh, what I want you to notice is that the estimated divorce rates um, appear in two places. So at the very top of this model, it looks like a linear regression, except the thing on the left is a parameter something we haven't observed. But that's what we want. We want a regression on the real divorce rate, which we can't see, not on the observed divorce rate, because we know the observed divorce rate is measured with error. And we have information about that error. Yeah, this is crazy, right? It's not. It works. And uh, so the top part looks like a linear regression. Um, our estimated divorce rate, the true divorce rate, uh, is normally distributed with mean mu, standard deviation sigma. Uh, then we have our you know, ye olde linear model, Right there, it needs no introduction, yeah. And then uh, we assign a distribution to our observations. This is another 
it looks like a regression model, right? Uh, we're not we're not predicting uh, it with anything except the identity of each state. So each state's observed divorce rate comes from a normal distribution with some true average divorce rate for that state, and then the standard error of our observation, which is a product of the way that the observation is made. And that's why we can put a value in there for it. Yeah, does that make sense? Does it make enough sense? <laughs> uh, and uh, and then some priors. Good. All right. So, well, I'm sorry. I have all this annotation, and then I just tell you guys stuff. And I animate. Sorry. So this is what I just said. Uh, so this is our trick where I, I get to talk about decolonizing Bayes again, right? So think about the vocabulary distinctions and the awkwardness of this. Whether something is a likelihood or a prior depends upon whether something is observed or not. So we used to call the top line in this model um, a likelihood, and I'm happy to still call it that, except the, the symbol on the left is a parameter now. So it's actually a prior, right? But it functions as a likelihood <laughs> in, in our inferential goals. You see the awkwardness of this. So this is the decolonizing Bayes thing, right? So the, the terms likelihood and prior actually come from a distinction which is fundamental to non-Bayesian approaches. It's, they say it's, it's fundamental to Bayes too once you know what's observed. You have to make the distinction uh, to do the calculations correctly. Uh, but in models like this, you start to see it gets awkward real fast, and it'd be nice to have some other vocabulary, which I have, I have none to provide. I'm sorry. Uh, it's hard to make new vocabulary. So, um, and then we have uh, another likelihood, which is the likelihood for each observation down there below. And this looks, looks like more traditional likelihood because the thing on the left is data. Uh, but now we also have data inside the thing uh, on the right. Yeah. Good times. Does this make sense? You with me? Yes. John's uh, angry stare always makes me nervous. <laughs> I know you're not angry, but you've got a real, your, your focus of concentration on nerves me. <laughs> there, all right. So, uh, all right, how does this look in code? It looks exactly like I set it up before. So you prep your data list, uh, no problem. Um, set up the model. Now, uh, divorce estimated is gonna be a parameter and um, we're going to, uh, you'll see down here, we're going to give it some initial values so, the, so, that map, so that Stan knows how long it should be. And it's normally distributed mu and sigma to find mu as normal, right? This is our regular linear model intercept. Um, this is age of marriage, and that's the marriage rate each state. And then the observed uh, divorce rate in each state is normally distributed with mean, the unknown true thing we'd like to know, we have to infer that mean, and then the measured standard deviation, or standard error, uh, which is just a standard deviation, and uh, then some priors, weekly regularizing priors. <coughs> you see the symmetry? Uh, the only trick here is that in this way of doing the code, you need to tell, um, you need to tell Stan how many elements there are in div s. So I, I initialized this vector of, um, of parameters with the observed values, right? That's just the initialization in the chain, but they wander from there. They move, right? You with me? Is this good? I, I'm very sympathetic uh, to the idea that this is a bit strange because it, it, the way statistics is usually taught does not prepare you for things like this. <laughs> it seem illegal. And uh, uh, if I can pause for a moment for, you know, sermon number 74, uh, <laughs> this will be a brief one. It's, for most routine regression problems in the sciences, you know, linear regression, logistic regression, whatever, it makes a little difference whether you do Bayes or not, provided you have some reasonable amount of data and you don't have much background information. Uh, uh, it hardly makes a difference. And often people will tell me this. It's like, well, it doesn't seem to matter. I did, I did it with the Markov chain, I did it without, and I get the same answer. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. So that's, that's the structure of the problem you're using. Right? You're using tools that are commonplace because they were developed by non-Bayesians. <laughs> right, and then we replicate them in the Bayesian framework, and lo and behold, they're very similar because it's the same model, just with priors now, and the priors get washed out. Uh, but there are lots of neighboring problems which are very, very difficult to access in a non-Bayesian framework and trivial to access in the Bayesian framework. So things can be interchangeable in one context; it makes little difference which you use. But if you modify them a little bit, it can be much, much easier to modify one approach than another. I think for me as a scientist, that's what I like about the Bayesian approach. 
It's not that it's fundamentally more correct than the other or that the other is broken. It's that it's once you've learned it, it's easy to make modifications and solve other kinds of problems like measurement error. And de dealing with measurement error in the non-Bayesian approach is possible, but it's very awkward. And there's this, a bunch of what I call ad hocery uh, involved, right? Ad hoc, what's the Latin? It's ad hocery. And ad hocery is, well, people just invent some procedure and then they see if it works. And you can do that. That's fine. I mean, that's mostly how science works. We just try stuff <laughs> and see if we can make predictions, right? So I'm not against that approach. It's that, but I think the, the Bayesian approach is more productive because you can modify it and get into useful uh, neighboring model spaces um, without awkwardness. And so this is an example of that, right? You, you've got information. Uh, to get the measurement error model, we just describe the measurement error inside the model. That's all we did. Uh, what, do, what do those standard errors mean? Well, they mean that the thing we observed, there's some average true value and then an error around it. That's what it means. You with me? Okay. <coughs> all right. Yeah, that was Sermon 74. Uh, and uh, so, as a consequence of this, uh, so you should look at the section in the book. Absolutely. I'm not going to step through every detail of the description of the book. There's a lot more you could say about the details of running this and inspecting the values. Let me just summarize for you what happens. Well, um, what happens is that there's a difference between uh, the original, the observed divorce rates, which I'm plotting on the left. On the left, I'm just showing you the scatter plot of the data. Uh, it's the observed divorce rate against the median age of marriage with the standard errors plotted. On the right, I'm showing you the posterior distributions of what the model thinks are the true divorce rates in each state. That's the vertical axis. It's not the data, it's the parameters. Yeah? And the now the bars are the posterior are widths of the posterior distribution. I think it's one standard deviation, each direction on the posterior distribution. Um, and you'll notice it's all shrunk, right? Why? That's the action of the regression line. Uh, some of these points, and here's the cool part, that won't surprise you, that's regression to the mean. Uh, some states are outliers, and then you, you enforce some relationship among all states, and then you know some of them move closer to the line. That's not exciting, right? That's just regression to the mean. Uh, that, that's normal. That's nothing new. Uh, the exciting part is that there's a pattern, uh, and the states with um, less certain measurements uh, of the divorce rate uh, shrink more. So, uh, yeah, this is what this is a slide I should have been on when I just said. So the divorce rate estimates move from the observed values. The, the model ends up thinking that, that the best estimate of the divorce rate in each state is not always centered on the observed value in each state. Yeah? And as a consequence of the assumptions of the model, the question is why. So this is like the pancake thing, right? And you find out your intuitions were wrong, and now you can learn something from that experience. That's what we wanted to. So why, why is that? Uh, the, the major reason is, well, there's the regression relationship. If, if a state has a really extreme divorce rate, the model is skeptical that it's really that extreme, and it shrinks it back towards the line. Uh, but, but the states move at different rates, as you will, towards the line, uh, towards one another. Uh, and part of that is where they are, uh, where their um, age, median age of marriage is, of course. Uh, but the exciting bit, the, the opportunity to learn here, comes from the fact that um, in small states, the divorce rate is, is highly uncertain. And so uh, you get much more flow of information from the total sample. The information in the whole data set flows into and informs the estimates of the divorce rate in the small states. Yeah. Very little of that happens for the big states, like New York, uh, because there are a lot of people and there's a lot of divorce. Right? Uh, didn't used to be historically, actually, if I can throw in an anecdote. It used to be that uh, New York, uh, it was illegal to get divorced in New York uh, because they were vying to have a very low divorce rate and look very moral. And so they exported their divorce to other states. Uh, and uh, Nevada, in particular, took up the call. And it used to be there were whole resorts in Nevada where New Yorkers would go and get divorced. Uh, there was a residency requirement. You had to live in Nevada for uh, it was a couple of weeks or something. So there were these residence hotels that New Yorkers went to. They took vacations, divorce vacations. And then we go to Reno. I think it was Reno was the first. And going these, uh, anyway, so I think this is the coolest uh, story. Right. So historically, New York has a low divorce rate on paper. <laughs> but the actual divorce rate was exported to another state. Yeah, I told you, it's a, it's a crazy world. The music's of the spheres, right? So, um, all right. So why do these divorce rates move? It's, it, this is pooling again, our friend pooling. And it happens automatically. So look at this. This is the idea. So what I plotted on the vertical is the difference between the estimated divorce rate, that's the posterior distribution, right? The posterior mean of each state's divorce rate, 
minus the observed value. So this is a measure of how much it moves. Yeah. So if you're, I've drawn a horizontal dashed line at zero. If a if if a point is on, if a state is on zero, that means that <coughs> excuse me, its posterior estimate of its divorce rate is exactly the same on average as the observed. It doesn't happen for very many states, but you, you do get it for some of the bigger ones. Um, and then on the horizontal, I plotted the, the observed standard error on the divorce rate. So big states are over here, small states are over here. And then you see that there's this blossoming of shrinkage. <laughs> uh, so some small states move down and others move up, but they're moving more. Uh, why? Because that's the only logical thing to do given the assumptions of the model. It's a necessary consequence of how you set the model up. Yeah? Does this make sense? This is worth running this model and poking through these and taking a look. Um, uh, absolutely is. Okay, making good time here. So let's go one step further. <coughs> Often we also have error on right-hand side variables. Uh, no problem. <laughs> so let's just add that information to the model and then see what the see what. Um, uh, the implications are. Again, you don't have to be clever. In fact, in general, I think it's a mistake to try to be clever. Just put the information uh, that you have inside the model and, uh, and then let logic figure out what the implications are. Um, the implications might be ridiculous and then, you, then your information is ridiculous, right? That's, you still learn something. So uh, we have lots of, so as I said, I was talking about ad hocery. This is what I should have saved Serve in 74 for this slide. Um, all the ad hocery. There are all kinds of ways that, um, creative and useful ways, the statisticians have invented to deal with measurement error on predictors. And you'll have these things like errors and variables, reduced major axis regression, this thing called total least squares. And these are ad hoc procedures that don't arise from any basic generative model of how it works. Uh, they, can, they can work, but they're very fragile because if you modify the data context a little bit, then they cease to give you good inferences. Uh, so that's the danger of the ad hocery of it all. Uh, it'd be much nicer if we could go from the information about the data generating process to an inferential model, and that's the Bayesian strategy. So our approach will be merely logical. We state the information we have about errors on variables, and then we deduce the implications, and of course, if it's garbage in, you get, you, you know, what happens. Yeah. So here's our new model. Um, this is like the previous model, but now we've got another likelihood, if you will, deep inside the model. There are three likelihood functions in one model now. Yeah. Um, I'm tempted to make an exhibit joke, but nobody remembers MTV's Pimp My Ride, right? Like, Yo, dog, I heard you like likelihoods. So I put some likelihoods. And, you know, okay. <laughs> no, I'm getting old, right? So when I was young, MTV had music. Yeah, <laughs> uh, long last century. Okay, so uh, uh, let's look at this model. So you don't need to under you understand the top part. Um, now, look what I've done is uh, we're going to focus on marriage rate, which is also measured with error for the same reasons that divorce rate is. You've got a finite sample every year, so. Uh, uh, the marriage rate has a standard error associated with it. So in the linear model, we replace the um, observed marriage rate with a parameter for each state, right? which is the true marriage rate, which we can't see. Uh, and then we create a likelihood for the observed marriage rate, which again is normally distributed with the true marriage rate as its mean uh, for each state i, and then the measured standard error of that. Which again is comes is a complicated thing, but it arises mainly from the uh, the size of the state and the size of the survey in the state. Yeah. Good. So this is just what we did before. The fact that it's a right side variable, it's okay. You just set up the assumptions and let it go. And I um, think uh, yeah. And then weekly regularizing priors. <coughs> so what happens? Well, the same stuff happens as before. Uh, you get pooling as a consequence, and you get more pooling. Uh, in those states where, in small states. So uh, the filled circles here are observed, uh, the open circles are estimated, um, and the lines connect points for the same states. It's like this, these shrinkage graphs that I tried to do in chapter 12 and 13. You remember those? Yeah, chapter 13, we had a bunch of these, didn't we? And 
Uh, we're plotting marriage rate posterior against divorce rate posterior. So now both axes here are posterior means. There's no data shown on this except, well, the blue stuff is data, yeah. But the open stuff is posterior means. And uh, you see that what's happened is extreme states, um, like this one over here, which has a very low marriage rate. I forget which state that is. Uh, uh, its divorce rate is also extremely low. Um, and so the model shrinks it dramatically towards the regression line. Yeah? Because there's a big standard error on that. And so the model says, well, it's very extreme. It's an outlier. Shrinkage kicks in, and it moves it. Yeah? Uh, states that are instead typical, really close to where the regression line ends up, don't move very much from the raw data. Yeah? Because they make sense given the overall relationship between these variables that's present in the data. The, the, the cool thing about this, well, there are a bunch of cool things about it, but one of the cool things is uh, the posterior distribution has dealt with all of this simultaneously. The fact that there's information moving in every direction. Every state informs every other state's estimate. And the intercept and slope on all the predictors. And the intercepts and slopes are influencing the estimates for the states, right? But those intercepts and slopes are inferred from parameters Right, remember now there's a parameter that is multiplying by a slope inside the regression model? Yeah? <laughs> right. That's pantomiming mind blown. Right? So here, uh, uh, this linear regression up here has got BR times RS is a parameter times a parameter. That, that's okay. Bayes will play. It just works. And uh, now it does, it's not magic. It, there's, there's residual uncertainty in these things, right? Because the job of Bayes is not to, is not to, uh, what's, what's an eloquent way to say this? Uh, the job of Bayes uh, is to tell us what conclusions we can justify, right? And sometimes the answer is none. <laughs> uh, but that's important. You want a statistical framework which can tell you that you have no business making conclusions, right? Now, all statistical frameworks can do that, absolutely. Uh, it's just... Uh, uh, how do you see it in Bayes? It's the width of the posterior distribution. Yeah? You've got a wide, flat posterior distribution, then lots of values are plausible, and you get it for free that way. In many other statistical frameworks, you can get that, but it's a secondary procedure after you do the fitting. You've got to do some secondary procedure to get a confidence interval. Right? And this is, in machine learning, this is sort of legendary, that there are a bunch of machine learning analyses which are just point estimates, and then point estimates are plugged into other uh, analytical procedures, and then I start screening. Right, <laughs> but no. The, in those methods, you can do, you can get it right. You can propagate the uncertainty. It's just it's a separate procedure. You don't do it while you're fitting the model. In Bayes, there's no separate procedure. The the estimator in Bayes is the posterior distribution, and it's a function. <laughs> um, it's it's smooth like this. All right, sorry. This is sermon seventy five. Right, but uh, you've heard this one before. So. All of that's going on simultaneously. Information is flowing in every direction. Every dimension in the posterior is informing all the others. They're jointly constraining one another. Uh, I, I continue to think that this is one of the coolest things about logic, is that it can all happen at once. It's the only thing that moves faster than the speed of light is information, and that's because it doesn't move. It's already there. <laughs> and the, the trick is that we need mathematics to tell us those implications, to tell us where it is. And that's what we do. Remember, we're just counting up. All the way stuff can happen according to our assumptions, but that counting is the procedure. The information is already there because as soon as you write the assumptions down, that the implications hold. Anyway, sorry, it was maybe too much poetry uh, for a Wednesday morning, right? Uh, poetry meant ironically, obviously. Does this make sense? Yeah. Um, so the details are going to matter, and in general, I can't tell you if you've got errors on your variables, whether they're predictors or outcomes, exactly what pattern of pooling will happen. It'll depend upon the details, but you can set up the model in the same strategic way and see what the implications are. Sometimes measurement error uh, doesn't do anything to your analysis and you'd be fine ignoring it, but you won't know that until you put the measurement error in. Yeah, and I, as I keep saying, I think this was sermon number seven, uh, uh, the public is not paying us to do second best, right? So I, I feel, embarrassed for our discipline all the time when people say, yeah, I could do that, but it's a big bother, and, you know, it probably won't make a difference. It's like, let's let's bring in, you know, Mr. Taxpayer and ask him what he thinks of that attitude. I don't, I, I disapprove. We don't need the taxpayer. I definitely disapprove of that. We're, this is a professional discipline, and we're here to do the best job we can. 
sorry, sermon number seven, right? And I know I'm not going to get any disagreement here. Uh, well, there's, there's also authority issues to them, but no, because you all, this, you're all here because you agree about this, but, um, uh, but you know what I'm talking about, right? I'm sure you've heard this before. So that's why it's so important to, to, to make tools to help people uh, who are not statistical specialists do the best thing. That's, it's very important to do that. I do believe in division of labor. Um, okay, let me try to summarize this. Uh, we have an error on a predictor. <clears throat> you get shrinkage for both divorce rate and marriage rate. Divorce rate shrinks way more than marriage rate. And the question is why? When you run this example from the text in the comfort of your own home with your cup of tea or whatever, uh, you'll take a look at this. It, uh, you get shrinkage in both of these, but the divorce rates move way more from uh, the observed values than the marriage rates do. And, the, and so it's why is the question. This is like the pancake thing. It's a, it's a consequence of our assumptions, and the opportunity for learning arises from trying to figure that out. And the answer is because the beta coefficient uh, that, that measures the relationship, the strength of the relationship, the association, between divorce rate and marriage rate is not very big. Remember in these data, it's median age of marriage that is the good predictor. If you wanted to know, if there was one thing you could know about a state to help you predict this marriage rate, you would want to know the average age people get married at. It's the first thing you should ask. Other things matter too, and there's a ton of residual variation, uh, but that's the first thing you'd ask. And uh, marriage rate has almost no effect once you've accounted for the median age of marriage. If you don't know the median age of marriage, the marriage rate is predictive, right? This is this partial association thing we did back in chapter five. So the beta coefficient is approximately zero, right? With some mass on both sides of zero. It's approximately zero. As a consequence, the model doesn't know how to pool those things, the marriage rates. It's got no way to do better for them because it's like you just told it, well, there's some error, it's symmetric, but then there's no relationship between the marriage rates and anything else you know. So it doesn't get tugged in any particular direction. It's fundamentally different than what happens to divorce rate, because the divorce rates are strongly associated with the age of marriage. And so if a state has a particular age of marriage, and its divorce, observed divorce rate's inconsistent with the regression relationship, uh, then it will move uh, the observed divorce rate to some posterior rate that's different. Does this make some sense? So this, this is one of these cases, I think that sentence I just gave was like a paragraph long, and uh, there wasn't enough grammar in English language to structure what was modifying what there. I apologize, but I felt that as I was speaking, it's like, well, I could really use a data to write about now. <laughs> but uh, did it make sense? Uh, uh, too many rates and rates, right? The rate of the rate. Um, so uh, this is a general sort of phenomenon, is that in the model intuited it because it figured out that beta coefficient, which, which is like in your in your uh, previous multi-level models, it determines how much pooling you get, how much information is moved between divorce, between the, the different variables. So in the pooling models, you had, remember when we did random slopes two weeks ago, chapter 13? There were correlation parameters that determined how much information moved across intercepts and slopes. Uh, the beta coefficient on, um, sorry, which, which slide is it on? Yeah, the beta coefficient on the marriage rate there, B sub R, is acting somewhat analogously to those correlations because it moves information between the estimates for divorce rate and marriage rate, right? We don't know either. It's like intercepts and slopes. You didn't know the random intercepts and slopes of each group. These are now for each state, there's an unknown divorce rate and an unknown marriage rate. These are like random intercepts and slopes. And if the correlation between them is approximately zero, as it is here, then no information moves between them. Yeah, and that's that's why you don't get uh, much shrinkage on the marriage rates. Anyway, I hope that was that was useful to understand. Um, okay, I'm I'm right on time here. So um, here's my summary slide on measurement error. Uh, this is a really common uh, malady. Uh, lots of data, even experimental data, has measurement error. Yeah, so there, you can deal with it this way. Um, uh, just some quick examples before I close. Uh, lots of prediction with averages. Um, this is an example we've worked with here. You don't have to use the average. You can instead use the posterior distribution of the average, which is what we've done in this case. <coughs> um, 
DNA sequence data, uh, you should respect the error rate in the sequencer. <laughs> this is the geneticists here know about this. This is a very common problem. And uh, this is why you do a bunch of reads, right? <laughs> they have these giant read numbers on genomes. Uh, and, uh, but still, if there are still problems where, like say you're looking for mutational hotspots, if mutation rates are low, they can be approximately the same as the error rate on sequencing. And then given that you've seen a mutation, it's about a coin flip, whether it's actually a mutation. So you need reads, yeah? This is why you do multiple reads. Uh, so this is about respecting error rates. And uh, parentage analysis, uh, similar things. Uh, there's a probability distribution over possible parents. Usually you can't uh, know uh, parents for sure in wild populations. Yeah, this is also true for humans, by the way. Yeah. And phylogenetic trees, same thing. There's not a tree. There's a posterior distribution of trees, and it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. and once you get over your terror, you can settle in and do good stuff with it. But it's, it's, uh, there are a whole lot of trees in there. It's like, oh my god, it's full of trees, right? And uh, uh, archaeology, paleontology, forensics, obviously, uh, if there's a hole in the ground and you dug something out and you're trying to figure out how old it was, there might be some uncertainty. Yeah. Now, I focus on things that are important in this building, uh, where we do evolutionary anthropology, and we have problems like this all the time. But I think, for those of you who do experimental psychology, I'm sure you can think of ways uh, that this is relevant as well. Okay. So with that, I'm going to stop here. Uh, when you come back on Friday, we're going to pick up on this slide and talk about missing data. Thank you for your indulgence. I'll see you on Friday.